Um, well, it's it's a joy to to be uh, a part of this this particular series. I, I I definitely always like talking. Oh, this has my name on it. Yo, reserve the bottle. Okay, okay. Now how to feel? Make somebody feel special up in here. Okay. You see, it doesn't take much. My name on a water bottle. Warm fuzzies. Warm fuzzies. Um. That was reserved. Dr. J is reserved. You can't touch that one. Um, one you know, as we d- dive into this, uh, I always like talking about um, um, the story of Christmas and so many different aspects of it. And in, in my 30 years of preaching, I've never talked about Herod. And so when I was invited to, to talk about Herod, I was like, huh, this is interesting. Never really. You know, obviously we talked about him in the story and things like that, but never an, an intentional focus um, on him, and so I was like, "Well, this will be this will be a cool a cool challenge. Let's look and see what we what we dig up and what the Lord wants to say about this." And um, and so, but it's been pretty cool. Look forward to sharing some things with you. I was uh, listening to um, uh, Pastor Aaron share about Mary and Pastor Ken share about Joseph uh, last week. Um, man, it's just it's really important, I think, to see in light of what God was doing through Mary and in her heart and through Joseph and the things that made his decisions admirable and also difficult, but also how God used, how God used this crazy dude, like this guy who had serious paranoia, serious control issues, a lot of fear. Um, he was, he was um, very, very unstable in a lot of ways but in other ways, as a leader, he was really sharp. And so he's look at the, the person of King Herod. I want to dive in that a little bit so you can have this framework as we read the story. Some of you read this story before um, over and over, and others of you, it might be your first time. But I want to kind of share this, I, this, this portrait of, of Herod. So as we read the story, now we can read into it some of the reasons why, some of his rationale behind behind his decisions. Um, The Roman government was really overseeing all of of the region and because of their empire. And that they couldn't have, um, you know, absolute reign and authority and execute it without having people locally to execute their decrees and their judgments and taxes and things like that. And when there came time in the area of Galilee where these Jews decided to rebel against the taxes, the Romans like, we got we to have somebody over there that's going to really bring the hammer down. And they found none other than 23-year-old Herod. 23. 23. When he, when he started. And so it's like, man, what, did you, what were you doing at 23? You know what I mean? Like, that's a lot of pressure. You like to be, be the governor of a whole area, and not just the governor over a whole area, but with the charge of making sure that you are faithful to the Roman Empire who put you there, but also navigating the complexities of trying to gain the popularity of the people you're trying to rule and the favor of the people you're trying to rule, the Jews. But interestingly enough, because Herod had... Um, Different, some different layers to his to who he was that made all of this really, really challenging for him. First of all, he's put as a king over Jews, but he's not a Jew. So that's a problem for Jews, because Jews are only go- going to accept a king that has a Jewish lineage, specifically the lineage of David. Herod didn't have that. Herod. Uh, ethnically was more of an Arab than he was a Jew. So, so from an ethnic perspective, as, as, as an Arab coming from an area called Idumea, um, he was not accepted by, by the Jews. So he had this ethnicity of being an Arab. He had the politics of Rome. But then he was a practicing Jew, a converted Jew, which isn't the same as the bloodline that the Jews actually acknowledge. So he had the politics of Rome, the ethnicity of Arabs, the religion of the Jews, and then he was just flat out crazy. (laughs) Right? Then he had the mentality of Tony Montana. 
you know. So, so as a person, he's thinking, if I'm going to really shine in the eyes of Rome, I've got to take the area that I have and develop it. So one of the things that scholars admire him for is his forward thinking, his ability to develop uh, urban areas in, in the area. He turned uh, one of the cities, uh, Caesarea, uh, Miranasa or something like that, into an international state city. Like it was a big, big, he turned it into like from Bethlehem to San Francisco as far as a port city, as far as commerce, as far as, as money. And, and, and so that, that was a bit forward thinking, especially for him. And then he had these huge architectural endeavors. He, he expanded the temple in, in, uh, uh, for the Jews. That's what we call it, Herod's temple. It was, it was amazing. Now, why would he do that? Well, because he's trying to, again, one, the, the, the size that he built the temple, it was impressive, even to Rome. And then for a relational aspect to the Jews, it was a big favor to them. They thought it would, it would again, cause them to be favorable in the eyes of the Jews. But it's like, you know, Herod, building the temple and all is cool, but the way you kill people for nothing kind of takes away from it, you know? It just kind of takes away from it. And so, so the Jews, are, on one hand, are like, man, that's amazing, great, great job on the temple. It's like, what? Well, yes, but you, they just, they took some bread and they executed all of them. I just killed him. Like, no trial, no nothing. Like, that's, that's, that's off. What they didn't realize is, and yet you, we, you and I would see over time, is that he had this real, real problem with trying to figure out how do I hold on to power? How do I expand my power? How do I eliminate any threats to my power? And that's where he had, he was just kind of like, ugh, like crazy off. Right? So he, did, he didn't deal with any, any potential threats very strategically or, 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 or diplomatically. He, he didn't at all. As a matter of fact, um, he thought some of his sons were going to try to rise up. He killed his sons. Thought his wife was in on it. Killed her too. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, it's one thing for a, a dad to kind of put his sons in check. His sons grow up and start, they start talking back and try to get a little too big with their britches and dad's got to be like, what, what? I'm still your dad. Right. I, I, I will, we will do some things here in the living room, if that's what it takes. It's, it's one thing to kind of flex on the son, let you know, hey, you're the son, I'm still dad, don't roll up on me like that. It's a whole other thing to be like, oh you, you, oh, you want my throne? I heard you want my throne. I'm not quite sure, but just in case. Three of them. Wife and three kids. He killed them. Because it looked like they might try something. That's Herod. That's Herod. Brilliant futurist, builder, economist. But when it came to his throne and power, he had paranoia. And so he was brutal on the one hand, but brilliant on another hand. That's why scholars, even today, just still look at him like, man, this dude. Really good over here, but really weird over here. It's this guy, sensitive to any threat. It's this guy, always having an eye for what could possibly go wrong. It's this guy who's trying to make a name for himself, continue to grow his, the, the, the empire in Rome in the area that he's in. It's this guy who really did a good job of navigating the sensitive political climate for over 30 years of his reign before he died. It's this guy that we find in Matthew chapter two. <laughs> the wise men come up and say, hey, we've come because we heard there's a new king. You see, now you know, huh? Now you see how that, why that went over the way it did. So, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Where is he who has been born, this is what Herod's hearing, to replace you? Because Herod was the king of the Jews. Not a Jew, but king of the Jews. He was considered, he saw himself king of the Jews. 
then these guys come. And it's not like they just came off the street like we heard a rumor. No, they are dressed. They are royalty. They are high class. So when they say there's someone born king of the Jews, this is not like just some subtle rumor. Clearly, there is some credibility to this declaration and to this, this anticipation. So Herod takes this seriously. Where is he who's born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at his rising and have come to worship him. Okay, now cosmically, they view those kinds of things even way more than we do. For someone, for a person, and their significance to be represented by some kind of cosmic indication also added to the significance of who this person would be. Where is he who was born king of the Jews with the endorsement of a star? <laughs> right? Hair is like, oh, 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 so there's a king around here? Oh, so you're not, you didn't even come here to say, hey, king of the Jews. Like, you didn't even acknowledge me as king. You came to me, the king of the Jews, asking where is the king of the Jews? Okay, well, let me not, let me not tip y'all off too much because right now I still need y'all on my side because I need to work something. I need to use the knowledge you have. I need to use the knowledge that you're going to have in my Favor. When King Herod heard this in verse 3, he was deeply disturbed. And guess what? When Herod is disturbed, guess who else is disturbed? All of Jerusalem with him. Who's going to die? Who's going to die? Because when this dude gets mad, somebody dies. He was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When you have a person who is ruled by fear and they're controlled by fear. A person controlled by fear controls others by fear. It's just kind of a way that it's uh, uh, contagious. It's just, it goes from the inside out. On the other hand, we have a person who is controlled by love and compelled by love, as Heidi Baker would say. That also is catchy. So here you have this earthly king with fear, brutality, death, control, who is reigning as another king enters the realm of earth, the total opposite. It's not fear, it's love. It's not here to amass power, but he's actually here, he's going to give power away. It's not a temporary kingdom, but he's bringing in an earthly, uh, an eternal kingdom. It's interesting as you look at Herod to see this juxtaposition of Herod and his kingdom and his character and his personality and how he rules compared to the one he's going to try to kill. So Herod says, let me, let me, I'm going to take this seriously. Uh, he assembled the chief priests and the scribes of the people and asked them, where is the Messiah be born. All right, you all, this, this guy, these, these wise men have come and saying that this is going to happen. Uh, uh, let me assemble y'all. Where, where are the details? I know y'all know what this guy's talking about. Where, where are the details? Where does it say that this, this, this Messiah is going to be born? And so, one of the things I want to highlight here is I want you to see how so many Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled right here, just in chapter 2. All right, I want you to see how God navigates his people around the evil and the intentions of Herod to do things specifically to fulfill prophecies that were said hundreds of years ago that that's what they would do. So in the prophecies in the Old Testament that pointed to all the things that were going to happen in Jesus' life, God also includes and calculates Herod's evil. It'll be more clear in a second. So he summoned all the chief priests and scribes. Where is the Messiah going to be born? And the scribes say, here is the Old Testament prophecy. It says this, in Bethlehem of Judea. 
because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So now Herod has a location. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. When did this star appear to you? Because I got to get the age of this boy. When did the star appear to you? And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. Now, if you know anything about Herod, Herod worships nothing but himself. Go and, and, and find out the location and come back and report back to me so that I too can go and, and worship. You see the evil, you see the intentions, you see the deception, you see the, um, uh, the conniving in order to make a power move and a power play. But what you got to all power move and a power play. But what you got to also see is what Herod has said and the intentions of Herod's heart are already calculated in the equation of the birth story. Herod is not saying or doing anything outside of God's eyes. God already has a plan to work around Herod's evil intentions. Now, the other thing I want you to see here as we pick up, I'm just going to highlight it now. So as we read through it, you can, I want these to just to jump off the page to you. Even though Herod is evil... And God does not change Herod. God does not remove Herod. What God does with his people is he leads them around the landmines. One of the themes you see in Matthew chapter 2 is how God speaks to his people. Go here. Do this. Leave now. Watch out for this. Here's a warning for this. And he navigates them all around. So let's watch. Let's watch. Report back to me so that I can go and worship. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy, entering the house, not a manger. Somebody say the house. house. This wasn't the same night he was born. Remember, they saw a star in the east, and they had to travel. The wise men were not at the manger. All right. It looks cool in the pictures. It's still powerful, but it's, 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 this, he wasn't in hay and wrapped in swallowing clothes when the wise men got there. They were situated now in a house. This is not a manger. They saw the child with Mary, his mother, falling to their knees. They worshiped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented with him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being what? Yeah. Yeah. Being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. They return to their own country by another route. Now, because Herod is like a schemer, you know, one thing schemers don't like is to be schemed on. <laughs> Verse 13, after they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a what? And said, get up. Take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. The wise men were warned in a dream. Joseph was warned in a dream. All about Herod, huh? God didn't remove Herod. He navigated around Herod. But he also used Herod to fulfill prophecy. Let's continue. So, so he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and escaped to Egypt. Now, let me just stop right there. Now, he had this dream from God warning him. At this point in the game, Joseph knows he's not having a normal life. 
He's, he's picking up on that, right? right? Even if he was slow, he'd get it by now. <laughs> Joseph has been led by the Spirit of God this whole time. When he could have put Mary away, the message came, no, take her. I know she said she's pregnant. That I, I, I did it, and I did. That's, that's a hard one to grasp, right? Mary, God gave me pregnant. Okay. <laughs> if we're going to have relationships, it's got to be built on trust. You can't be saying stuff <laughs> like, like that. God got you. Come on, man. Just, just confess. What, who was it? What? The streams. So God warns the wise men, don't go back to Herod. God warns Joseph, take the child because of Herod. And then he got up. He took it seriously. That's my point. He, took it, he didn't just go, oh, was that the pizza from last night? I don't know. Oh, was this the Lord? If it's not the Lord, I don't know. Let me, let me try to go find a prophet to confirm it four or five different times. I don't, it's like, no, no. He knew it like that. He took action like that. It was important like that. That's what I want to highlight here. Joseph, get the child, go to Egypt. Babe, we got to go. It's up. I mean, that's it. Right? There's no, no deliberation. So, verse 15, he stayed there until Herod's death, so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt, I called my son. So in the Old Testament, that's one of the prophecies, that out of Egypt, I've called my son. And so now here it is, and God tells Joseph in a dream, take the child to Egypt. Why? Because Herod's trying to kill the child. Take the child to Egypt. Stay there. I'll let you know when the coast is clear. And then, in verse 16, Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. No surprise there. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time that he learned from the wise men. Based on what the wise men said, when they saw the star, how long they got here, this baby's about two years old, so kill all the boys, just to make sure we get them, just kill all the boys. This kind of reminds us of the, the, the attempt to kill Moses in, in Egypt. Kill all the boys. Hmm. And this is in keeping with the time you learn from the wise men. Verse 17. Then what was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. Interesting. You have a prophet about him coming out of Egypt fulfilled because of Herod. Herod wanted to kill him. The, the dream comes, go to Egypt. He's going to fulfill the prophecy of coming back out of Egypt. Now there's another prophet, a prophecy from Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel, symbolizing the matriarch of, of, over Israel, symbolizing the mother of Israel, weeping over her children. And she refused to be consoled because they are no more. Another prophecy fulfilled. Verse 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a what? Amen. Appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, because those who intended to kill the child are dead. So he got up took the child and his mother and entered the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was like, oh, wait, oh, wait a minute. Wait, is this generational? Uh, what's, what's going on? He was afraid to go there and being warned in a... Am I making it? <laughs> he withdrew to the region of Galilee. Why would he go there? Then he went and settled in a town called Nazareth to fulfill what was. That he would be called a Nazarene. As crazy as Herod was, God knew it. God made plans for it. And he navigated his people around it. 
in our in our world today, y'all, there's a bunch of Herods. There's a bunch of people who, out of a need for power, a lust for power and greed, and through their earthly paradigm of what it means to be a king and to reign and to, to control people, they will resist the idea of us worshiping a different king. They will resist the idea of us acknowledging a different king. A king whose kingdom is not of this world. He comes crashing in, in a manger in Bethlehem, and grows up to preach this news, the kingdom of God is here. It is an invisible kingdom, but it is an e eternal kingdom. It is an invisible kingdom, but it is a counterintuitive kingdom. It is a superior kingdom. It is one in which there is only one king who will reign forever, Jesus Christ, but one in which everyone is invited to be a part of it if they will bow. Acknowledge Christ as king. Deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow him. All are invited, but only the few that meet the standard of putting their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, as Lord, as King forever, are the ones who will be in. What we see in Herod is a picture of the kind of persecution that we see it surrounding the birth of Jesus, but we will also see it in our world today. The name of Jesus, the allegiance we have to him as a king, it will be in opposition to our allegiance to anything else, to our allegiance to America. Listen, as a veteran, I signed up to die for this country. I really did. So many of you did, did as well. And if you didn't sign up to do it, you probably would still do it because, I mean, you, you, you just really love our country. I get all that. But our allegiance to our, our, our great country, America, is nowhere near and should be subjected to our allegiance to Christ. And if we have to make a choice between following the American way or following what Jesus said, we're going to follow what Jesus said. Amen. And as we follow what Jesus says, when persecution comes, when the Herods of this world come on whatever level, you can trust that God will speak to you about what to do to navigate around Herod. If you don't, Herod could get you. What if Joseph didn't listen? Every time. You know how many dreams? You know, the Joseph in the Old Testament gets the, gets the name. This is Joseph the dreamer. He only had two. All right. and <laughs> Joseph, Joseph in the Old Testament only had two dreams. And they're both about his family. Like bound down to him. One with just his brothers, then, his bro then the next one with his brothers and his parents. Like that was it. And you call him Joseph the dreamer. No, this is the Joseph who was dreaming. In the Old Testament, Joseph's gift was administration. That's what it showed up everywhere he went. His main gift wasn't dreaming. And there's Joseph here who has dream after dream after dream. We don't say it's, it's a gift. We just, we just watch how God was just leading him. And that's kind of one of the things I want, I want you to I want to normalize, how even though there are Herods here and Herods today, that the God leads his people to navigate around. It's important to listen, to recognize what he's speaking, and to listen, because God will give you warnings. God will lead his people. All these warning dreams that God gave in Matthew chapter 2 were all about Herod. <laughs> all about Herod. Herod's in there. But God navigates his people all around, all around Herod. And he'll do the same for you. So the question, I think, matter of fact, uh, Aaron mentioned a couple uh, weeks ago when he was talking about Mary, a question, the story, uh, the popular song, Mary, Did You Know? Well, the answer is yes. Like, <laughs> like she's saying about it. I don't even know how the author of that song must not have read the Bible. 
Um, it's, a, it's a popular song. It sounds really cool. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Did you know that? Yeah, like he said, yeah. But she sang about it. She wrote, this, she wrote a song saying, hey, guys, I know. That's the name of her song. <laughs> Don't ask me if I know. I wrote my song first. I'm telling you I know. I worshiped him because I know. But Herod, Herod, did you know that the child you're trying to kill would die for your sins? Herod, did you know that your rage and anger would not be more than the quiet prayers of a mother protecting her son. Herod, did you know that your arms are too short to box with God? (laughs) Herod, did you know that like Ken said last week, the sovereignty of God, whatever God wants to do, he's going to do. You can't thwart it. You can try to kill Jesus, but Jesus is the Son of God and came on a mission. There's nothing you're going to do to stop it. So the answer to Mary, did you know, is yes. The answer to Herod, did you know, is no. There's more I want to say, but it's time for communion. As we celebrate communion, the death of Christ on the cross, he doesn't get to Calvary without Bethlehem. And he doesn't get to Bethlehem without the Father's plan before the foundation of the world. The Lamb was slain. The plan of redemption was made for all of us. And nothing, nothing, not even the devil's best strategies can stop God's plan. Let that be your takeaway from Matthew chapter 2. God's plan for Jesus, God's plan for you, it cannot be stopped, even as crazy as Herod is. With all his conniving, all his tricks, the tricks of man will never, never compare to the wisdom of God. And that's what you tap into when you allow him to lead you. Guys, Herod is still alive today. You can encounter Herod in your family. You can encounter Herod at work. You will definitely encounter Herod in our government and in the events of the world. But you and I, we belong to a whole nother king. And the reason why we're able to step into that relationship with him is because of what he did on the cross. Did you want to come up, Sean? And continue to lead us and then I'll, I'll sit down and partake with my water with my name on it Amen. Amen.